Let me turn to our next speaker, Dan Krakow. Dan is uh, heads up the uh, uh, FDA and Healthcare Regulatory Practice Group at Arnold and Porter. Uh, I, I've been looking forward to this talk because of the title, Facilitating a Partnership with the FDA. Uh, many of us who have worked a lot with the FDA wonder how that might work. Uh, I can remember. I'll you right up there. I, I can remember a meeting at the FDA where we gave a long presentation, a very long presentation of all the things we wanted to do in our big program. And a woman, a woman named Minnie Baylor Henry, who was really smart, looked at me with this shark-like grin and said, you done? I said, yeah, well, we're done. And she said, okay, now let me tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know the FDA, meet the FDA. And Dan, maybe you can tell us how to make it work better. <laughs> Is that better? I'll adjust the volume well, up there. Uh, well, well, I hate to tell you this, but I changed the name of the presentation. So uh, uh, to focus on regulatory and legal challenges and opportunities. And I thought, um, I, I thought I might have a controversial presentation today. But after the last one, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a little tough, I have to tell you. Um, but it is relevant to the, to the discussion uh, we just had because a lot of people think about personalized medicine uh, as an issue of boutique medicine, as expensive medicine. Uh, and certainly there are aspects of personalized medicine that are extremely expensive. Uh, but it's also about clinical utility. And that's really the goal of personalized medicine in many respects, is reaching a, a state in which we have uh, diagnostics that can be used in combination uh, with drugs to ensure that our dosing uh, is appropriate for those drugs, to ensure that we're only using those drugs and biologics with patients uh, for whom uh, they're actually going to work or have a chance of working given their genetic makeup. And, and what I'm going to focus on today is uh, the regulatory framework around that uh, and some of the problems in that regulatory framework. Um, and part of the reason uh, for that, uh, those problems uh, and the reason it's coming to a head today is that we have a long history in this country uh, of regulating drugs and biologics uh, and medical devices, on the other hand, in very, very different ways. Uh, and now, with personalized medicine, we have a scenario where two very different regulatory constructs are coming together, uh, and they don't necessarily fit together very comfortably. Uh, and it's causing some problems, and typically what has happened uh, in the history of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in this country uh, has been that there's a crisis or a severe prob regulatory problem uh, and new legislation is enacted. And so what, uh, what we may be leading up to uh, in terms of what I'm going to discuss today uh, is a new regulatory framework to try to deal with the issue of personalized medicine. I'll talk about what that, uh, a bit about what that, that might look like. Um, but just to spend a minute on those two different pathways that drugs and biologics have emerged in this country. Um, Many people don't know it, but the regulation of, uh, of drugs and biologics in this country go, goes back to the early 1800s. The first legislation passed in this country dealt with uh, a biologic. It was smallpox vaccine. Uh, and it actually um, uh, provided free mailing rights for smallpox, uh, for the scabs that were used for smallpox. Uh, and that was the first regulatory framework for, for biologics in this country. It goes way back. The first true statutes that regulated biologics in terms of what would, would become the Food and Drug Administration uh, were enacted in 1902 in the case of the Public Health Service Act and in 1906 in, in, in terms of the Pure Food and Drugs Act, which was the pers first regulation of drugs in this country in terms of uh, a federal, true federal regulation. Uh, but drugs went a lot, uh, proceeded on a very different path. In 1938, we had the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But what many people don't realize today, uh, we think about the pharmaceutical industry uh, as if it's always been in, in the form it is in today and the research and development that occurs. But in fact, there was no efficacy requirement for drugs in this country until 1962. Uh, until 1962, you did not actually have to prove that your drug worked before you put it on the market. It was really that decision by Congress and the kefauver harris Amendments in 1962 that created the modern pharmaceutical industry, the modern biotech industry, if you will, uh, and just kicked off an era, decades and decades, uh, of research, the research and development we see today, and many of the, the very profound advances that we've had. Medical devices, which includes diagnostics, which are in, a very important component, obviously, of personalized medicine, have had a very different history in this country. It wasn't until 1976, 1976, that we had true regulation 
of medical devices in, in this country. Uh, and it was risk-based regulations. Many medical devices received no regulation at all, essentially. Uh, some, you simply had to show that you were substantially equivalent to devices that were on the market prior to 1976, and that's it. Uh, and for new technologies, as of 1976, you had to prove that it actually was safe uh, and effective. We have a problem? Okay, sure. A little higher. Just a little too low. Try that. Sorry about that. Um, so we have two very, very different regulatory regi regimes, different standards for approval, different path <clears throat> pathways for approval, different parts of FDA that, uh, that regulate those two different technologies, uh, different payment systems typically for those two different technologies, both private and public payment systems that are converging in personalized medicine. Uh, and what we're starting to see is some serious problems and, and confusion. And this letter, which you probably can't read, is a letter from the Food and Drug Administration that just went out in the last few weeks, uh, actually last week, uh, and it's related to a, the Pathway Genomics Genetic Health Report. And this was something that was going to be sold on the shelves in Walgreens, uh, and uh, as described here, it's intended to report customary and personal genetic health disposition results for more than 70 health conditions, including pharmacogenetics, prescription medication response, propensity for complex disease, and carrier status, pre-pregnancy health information, uh, et cetera. And I thought FDA was very polite about this. Uh, if you, you probably can't read the letter, but FDA said, we've conducted a review of our files and we've been unable to identify any FDA clearance or approval number for the genetic health report. We request that you provide us with that number for the genetic health report. If you don't believe you're required to obtain FDA clearance or approval, please provide us with the basis for that determination. I thought. For a regulatory agency, uh, that was about as polite as it gets, unlike the experience, some of the experiences that many of us have had uh, in terms of the regulatory process. This is not really what we're talking about in terms of personalized medicine. This is uh, the, the direct-to-consumer use of genetic health information, which is very interesting, may have some benefits, but really a wholly different uh, set of issues in many ways. Uh, but what we're really talking about, or at least what I'm talking about today, uh, is the use of diagnostics in conjunction with drugs, often very expensive drugs, to try to identify the patients for whom that product is going to work, uh, or to ensure that the dosing is appropriate, or to avoid, and this is probably the most important application today, is to try to avoid adverse events. Uh, but we have a system as, as uh, just by the fact that this was on the front page of the New York Times, that is producing a problem. And that problem is that diagnostic tests are regulated in a very uneven way in this country. Uh, and there is no clear pathway for converging the two at this time for personalized medicine to achieve some of those benefits that these technologies could, uh, could achieve. How are these diagnostic tests regulated? Well, it's a very strange system. Test kits, a kit, a diagnostic kit that goes out into interstate commerce that is labeled for use in conjunction with testing for a disease or disorder, uh, needs to receive approval from FDA, either a, or clearance from FDA, either a PMA, which is an approval, pre-market approval application, or clearance under a 510K, substantial, showing substantial equivalence to a prior test. But there are many, many technologies out there that are in use today to test uh, for various diseases, to test for uh, uh, test individuals for whether they can metabolize a drug, for example, uh, that are not regulated by FDA. They could be regulated by FDA. The FDA has taken the position that it has jurisdiction over them. But most home brews, as they're called, lab developed tests, uh, are generally not approved or cleared by FDA. They're regulated under what's called the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, which regulates them in terms of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, sets the standards, issues certificates to labs, develops uh, standards for the various complexity of the testing performed by labs. But these are not actually approved or shown to, be, uh, to have clinical utility, to have meaning in terms of, of the potential use in conjunction with the drug or a particular disease. Uh, they're simply regulated as a lab. Um, there is an exception to this. They're called IVDIMAs. They are, are tests for which 
uh, that I'll let you read the defin here, definition here yourself, that provide a score or an index that physicians can't necessarily on their own calculate or understand. But most of the tests that are out there today, these home brews, uh, with the exception of some that are, that are of, of certain ingredients that are used in those tests, known as analyte-specific reagents, and only then uh, when they are used for things like screening of blood or for serious contagious diseases, uh, most lab-developed tests are not regulated in terms of the way we regulate drugs, the way we regulate medical devices that require approval or, e or even clearance. Um, so we have a, a disconnect today between uh, the, the goal of connecting drugs uh, with uh, diagnostic products and two different regulatory regimes, one that requires you in infinite detail uh, to provide evidence uh, that a drug or a biologic is safe and effective, uh, and another in which you may have a diagnostic that's associated with that drug that could be approved by FDA that may be referenced in the labeling of that drug, and increasingly that's happened. Uh, but you also have labs across the country that are offering that same test without the same kind of assurance in terms of the utility of that test in relation to that drug. Uh, and hence the New York Times article in terms of the validity of those tests and the problem that, that is out there today in terms of pushing forward into personalized medicine and creating an environment where, where the healthcare system can say, uh, yes, this has clinical utility in terms of using these tests with drugs, uh, and uh, we're going to pay for that. And in fact, there are certain uh, parties out there who are saying, uh, FDA, you need to address this issue. And in fact, there's a citizen petition that was filed to FDA in, in 2008 uh, that FDA is uh, thinking about. Uh, like most things, uh, uh, regulatory, uh, citizen petition is supposed to have a response within 180 days, but as you can probably tell, that, that hasn't occurred. It's now 2010. Uh, but uh, the point of this citizen petition is essentially, FDA, if you're going to have labs out there saying that they have a test that should be used in conjunction with a biologic, they should have to prove it. They should have to get approval. Uh, there should be a risk-based construct for doing that, but if, but if labs are out there suggesting that a particular product has performance characteristics in terms of human health, they should have to prove it or you should take enforcement action. And this is really the issue before FDA today. Uh, it's an issue that's going to be before Congress because in 2012, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act uh, needs to be re reauthorized. The medical device user fee construct needs to be reauthorized by Congress as well. And that has traditionally been a vehicle for Congress taking a look at the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and determining what changes need to be made. Um, and, and in fact, there are many changes that will be made to the medical, that may be made to the medical device uh, regulatory regime, and this is going to be uh, among them in terms of the agenda for uh, the reauthorization of those statutes in, in several years. Uh, but that's the amount of time it takes to develop these issues. But th this issue is before FDA, FDA is considering what to do about this uh, and how it relates to the issue of personalized medicine. And in fact, FDA is also working on guidance on the code development of drugs uh, and diagnostics. There's an internal FDA working group. There's a guidance in process. Uh, but this is not an easy thing to do in terms of trying to develop a construct for code development of these products. It is not uh, always evident at the beginning of the development of the therapeutic product that there's a, one, that there's a biomarker, two, that the biomarker is meaningful, uh, and three, that you can, uh, that it makes sense to incorporate that into clinical, uh, into the clinical research. And what is the impact on the drug development process uh, if uh, that is required in terms of trying to develop a diagnostic in, in conjunction with a drug? Will that ever be the, the uh, a requirement in, in terms of drugs? Probably not in terms of the science, but there needs to be flexibility in this construct. It's extremely complex given the various regulatory systems uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, and so this, but this is going to be an extremely important document uh, that's going to come out hopefully within the next year uh, to try to give better guidance in terms of how do you develop drugs in conjunction with these diagnostics in order to demonstrate the clinical utility of that diagnostic in conjunction with that drug or biologic and to have it in the label still leaves the question of what happens to those labs out there that are saying that they may have clinical utility in conjunction with that very same product. And that was the point of the petition to FDA. But 
the train's already left the station. And in some cases, it's fully validated. You have Herceptin, for example, which is associated with the test. It was developed with that test. It's in the label of that product, and there are other examples. And you have the increasing placement of testing information, genetic testing information, in the labeling of products. Warfarin is a very good example. Within the last few years, FDA uh, changed the label for warfarin products, a blood thinner product, uh, to improve the dosing uh, of warfarin, or with uh, the objective of improving the dosing, dosing of war warfarin, not a requirement for uh, prescribing warfarin, but uh, nonetheless a recommendation that uh, in the, at the, a notation that the existence of that genetic test is out there. And more recently, Plavix, another blood, uh, uh, blood thinning drug, uh, was labeled for uh, the, the fact that there are poor metabolizers of that drug, uh, and the label specifically references the availability of genetic testing. Uh, and there is, in fact, a test that's been approved uh, for uh, identifying those poor, uh, poor metabolizers. It wasn't developed in conjunction with that product, but yet uh, there is a test out there, and the, the existence of genetic testing is now referenced in the label. And we're, this is going to snowball. We're going to see this again and again and again in terms of as discoveries are made, as tests are developed, as they're approved, they're going in to be in the labels of drugs, and the question is, what do we do about that? And what are the implications of that for the healthcare system, for physicians, for patients, for the cost of that system, as we just heard? Uh, and while we're talking about uh, cost, who's going to pay? Uh, and there is a problem here. You could probably read it. Well, Bob, looks like a paper cut, but let's be sure. Let's do some tests. Um, there are a heck of a lot of tests that are done out there. And at a certain point, you do have to make distinctions about what can the healthcare system afford from a testing uh, perspective. And in fact, when the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services took a look at uh, the recommended testing, the genetic testing for dosing of warfarin, it said, thanks but no thanks. Uh, this isn't reasonable and necessary. Uh, we don't have enough outcomes data to show that this actually has a benefit, a clinical benefit. Uh, but they did say, uh, we have a process. It's called coverage with evidence development. Then in the context of a study, uh, and, and within certain other limitations in terms of patients who have not uh, previously been tested, uh, who are uh, new to warfarin dosing, uh, and if they're enrolled in the study, we'll pay for that. And so we'll develop the evidence, and maybe someday this will make sense from an outcomes perspective. Uh, and this is a, a reasonable mechanism for going, going about this, and in fact, we'll develop data over time. Uh, but you also have a problem in terms of the practice of medicine and the use of these tests and the increasing burden on physicians and on the healthcare system in terms of the complexity of the administration of drugs and biologics, the record keeping associated with that, and the controls that are being placed around the provision of drugs and biologics. And in fact, Congress in 2007 provided FDA with in terms of the history, of going back to the history of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, FDA has never had control over the use of drugs and biologics and other medical products as they are used in the healthcare system. FDA approves them and puts the, it lets them out there on the market. They go into interstate commerce, but doesn't regulate how they're used in the practice of medicine. Well, in 2007, uh, Congress reauthorized the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. And as part of that legislation, it was called the FDA Amendments Act, Congress gave FDA unprecedented authorities to make a determination either for a newly approved drug or in the case of a drug that, uh, for which new safety information is available, gave FDA the authority to say, look, we have new information or information has come to us with this application to suggest that if we don't put controls in place in the healthcare system to ensure the safe use of the drug, we can't ensure a benefit risk balance for this product such that it's safe, safe and effective and can be placed on the market. And these are really uh, very profound authorities uh, that can be used by FDA. There's a number of these programs. There's actually about 100 what are called REMS, Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies, that have put, been put in place. Only a small number of those have what are called elements to assure safe use. But uh, those elements to assure safe use are an interesting template in terms of personalized medicine uh, and where, what we may see in the future in terms of a multiplicity of controls on the use of drugs and biologics 
Uh, and uh, they include things like registering all physicians, patients, and pharmacists who, uh, who prescribe, dispense, and use the drug, patient agreements, uh, ensuring that only certain facilities uh, and certain physicians who have been properly trained and certified to prescribe those drugs uh, can, in fact, uh, prescribe them. So very intrusive, very comprehensive, very much a burden, not just on the healthcare system, but also a burden on the company uh, that uh, br brings that product to market in terms of running that system, because that's who runs that system, who collects the data, has to continually assess it, and report to FDA that that benefit risk balance is being maintained. Uh, and as these programs multiply, and as the tests bec become available to determine which patients should get those products, uh, well, it's only going to be a natural, and there have been certain examples already, such as the drug clozapine, which is associated with a uh, particular blood test. Um, it's only going to be a natural to use these new authorities to create a framework or a construct in the healthcare system to, system to ensure that, in fact, these diagnostic products are used in conjunction with drugs and biologics, particularly when they present a severe risk. So uh, these authorities are really in the early days in terms of FDA's use of them. Uh, they include other authorities, such as FDA's ability to actually change the label of a product, uh, to force the change in the labeling of a product, for example, to include genetic testing information that contributes to safety, or to require post a post-market study, including potentially a post-market study or trial uh, that would involve the validation of a test in conjunction with a drug. So a very complex regulatory construct uh, associated with some very potent new powers on, par on the part of FDA uh, that could drive uh, both a lot of benefits in terms of the use of products in the healthcare system, uh, as well as a lot of costs. An interesting question uh, that, uh, from a regulatory perspective, is how does comparative effectiveness relate to this? And FDA does not administer determinations about comparative effectiveness, but there's a lot going on in terms of comparative effectiveness uh, including a lot of money that's going to be spent uh, on uh, uh, doing comparative effectiveness studies over the next several decades, uh, and this is written into healthcare reform as recently passed, is also the Patient-Centered Out Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. You will hear a lot about PCORI over the next uh, several decades, because they are going to be looking at therapies, uh, and they are going to be uh, not making determinations about cost-effectiveness, but they're going to be setting priorities, funding studies, uh, and um, tried to advance the quality and the relevance of the evidence that's out there in terms of thera therapies and what works uh, and what doesn't work. Now, this poses both opportunities for personalized medicine as well as some real challenges. Uh, particularly initi initially, a lot of this comparative effectiveness research is gross research. You're comparing one therapy to another, one treatment intervention to another. The personalized uh, medicine is in many cases is about subpopulations. And one of the tensions in comparative effectiveness is how do you make this sort of gross comparison between therapies uh, and yet still preserve the ability to look at what happens to a particular subpopulation and how might that subpopulation be benefited in a, in a unique way. And so this is from a, the personalized medicine community perspective, this is a very, very important uh, area to watch in terms of making sure that issues of personalized medicine and the use of diagnostics uh, in conjunction with drugs, are inserted into the thinking on comparative effectiveness in the conduct of these studies. And we talked about lawyers, and as a lawyer, I, you know, I always want to see some legal angle on this, of course. Um, and this is a serious problem, and the use of tests uh, only compounds the problem in many ways. It, it can also insulate physicians because it adds another decision-making tool uh, it can make them more of a learned intermediary if they can use diagnostics to make decisions. They're not giving therapies to patients for whom there's no hope because of their genetic makeup that it's ever going to work for them. Uh, but uh, you can bet that there's going to be a proliferation of lawsuits uh, uh, that will second guess why tests weren't used, the validity of those tests, the accuracy of those tests, why companies didn't do research on a test or didn't use available technology uh, to develop a test and to ensure that was in the label. That's really one of the next waves of product liability and medical malpractice litigation that we're going to see around the issue of second-guessing why personalized medicine wasn't used. 
So uh, this, this is uh, a, an important issue as we move forward in terms of what kind of regulatory mandates are out there, the regulatory pathways we have, uh, and what gets in the label and what doesn't for uh, therapeutic products. Finally, I just want to look a, a bit forward uh, in, in terms of what might be done from a statutory perspective to deal with this issue. Because we are, uh, by uh, developing tests, uh, by uh, putting those tests and labeling, uh, by putting the burden on companies to develop those tests but not necessarily paying for them and starting to make the kind of choices uh, we just heard about in terms of the healthcare system, uh, how do we get companies to invest in ensuring the clinical utility uh, of these technologies. Well, there's a number of ideas that you will be hearing about over the next few years uh, that could be considered in, in the course of the reauthorization of the user fee acts or in legislation perhaps a bit further out uh, that would provide, potentially provide incentives for the development of uh, combina uh, combinations of drugs and diagnostics, the co-development of drugs and diagnostics, the development of innovative diagnostics to ensure uh, that drugs can be used safely. Uh, and those include, uh, one idea is to reward companies that develop these technologies with a, what's called a priority review voucher, a transferable priority review voucher. And this was already done several years ago in statute for companies that develop a therapy for a, a, a tropical disease, a rare tropical disease. Uh, you can get a priority review voucher. And what that means is, I develop that therapeutic, I can then transfer it to you, you're developing another product, and then you can take that voucher, go to FDA, and say, uh, FDA, I want you to review my product in six months rather than a year. Pretty, pretty good deal, because that's several, probably several hundred million dollars in certain cases. So it could be a very significant incentive in terms of my ability to either use that voucher or sell it to another company. Uh, another thought is, why not provide exclusivity to companies that either individually or join together to develop these combinations. In the case of pediatric studies, there was a problem identified about 10 years ago in this country that not enough studies were being done on pediatric populations for drugs. That, that the entire pediatric population was essentially an orphan population in terms of demonstrating the safety and efficacy of many drug products. And in fact, legislation was passed in which companies, they agreed to do the study, the pediatric studies on products, they would get six months of exclusivity that would be tacked on the, to the end of any existing exclusivity or patent term that they have. And it's been uh, an enormous success uh, in terms of developing a huge body of data on the pediatric uses of existing uh, therapies and, and new therapies as well. Uh, but it also has been a big cost to the system. There's been a lot of criticism over the fact that companies can spend several million dollars to do, to do a pediatric study and that six months of exclusivity might be worth $50 million, $100 million, whatever it might be. But Congress has reauthorized that program and it's remained in place. Orphan exclusivity as well. Seven years of exclusivity has been, despite the, the concern about uh, the development of orphan products and companies' willingness to invest in orphan products, I, I don't deny that that's an issue, but the Orphan Drug Act has been a, an amazing success story in terms of the development of many, many therapies for orphan drugs because of seven years of exclusivity that's provided to those companies to take those uh, therapies and develop them. And also tax credits, uh, uh, another way uh, to incentivize the development of products. So in terms of personalized medicine, the development of companion diagnostics and, and, and uh, the co-development of drugs and diagnostics, this may be something that we'll see in the future. We may also see more regulation uh, in terms of how diagnostics are, are, are handled in this country as well. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions for Dan? Larry? I even wrote down my question, but I forgot it. Oh, here's my question, and I, I, now I remember. Um, so in a little while, in like an hour or so, uh, David Lawrence is gonna give a talk about the consumer-centric something or another, and, and I bet he's gonna say, I don't know what he's gonna say, but I'll bet at some point he's gonna say, 
we ought to get rid of both the doctors and the FDA. Uh, and do you think for diagnostics that's a bad idea? Have you thought about that? Um, whether I think it's a bad idea, uh, you know, it, you know, I, the way I look at it is, uh, and I can tell you, back in 1994, there were proposals when the Congress changed over in 1994. That very proposal was made for drugs. Do away with the efficacy requirement for for drugs. Um, and uh, you know, I, I mean, frankly, I, I think uh, at a certain point, if you don't have a gatekeeper, uh, then the system for uh, the healthcare system in terms of evaluating technology, the incentives for developing data to prove what you do. You go back to the days prior to 1938 and prior to 1962 uh, when you have, you know, the, the old patent medicine show. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know about this test that's out there, this genomic screen. It may be a very valid test. I make no judgment on that. But at the end of the day, what, what um, What's developed since 1962 in this country is an enormous body of evidence that demonstrates that these things work, that they're going to help people. Yes, there's more to, to, to be done, but it's created an enormous benefit for society, for society, a lot of costs. And if we're going to start using tests, there's got to be a gatekeeper. Question. Uh, based on your cartoon about the paper cuts, do you have an idea what percentage of tests is as a result of no tort reform and worry about malpractice suit? Do you have any figured uh, percentage or otherwise? I, I'm sure that's been studied, but I don't have a, a specific oh. figure for Anybody it. Anybody else in the uh, audience uh, that has that information? Yeah, you know, I'm curious. Well, you know, one of the problems is, and I've been, I've been through the tort reform debates in, in Washington, is everyone's, everyone's got their own numbers on that. So uh, it is very hard to quantify what what is the effect of medical malpractice? What's the effect of product liability suits? Uh, but it certainly does, does have an effect. I, I thought David Snow told us $200 billion a year yesterday. But maybe that wasn't exactly the same answer to that same question. Sure. Um, I, I thought you were being very kind to the FDA. And I agree that we don't want to return to the days of patent medicines and you know, selling radium water as a cure-all or something like that. But the FDA has actually moved to, um, in recent years, beyond the point of respecting the science to, and, and sort of it's almost an anti-scientific view because if a pharmaceutical meets the scientific endpoints, they will say, well, you know, uh, lowering LDL cholesterol and raising HDL cholesterol isn't enough. We want you to spend several hundred million dollars more and look out and look at the effect on cardiovascular disease long term. As if the medical and scientific community don't already have abundant evidence that there's a correlation between cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. So, so I, I think that, that and, and I, apparently there was a promise a few years ago by a former FDA director to get back more to, a, to, to using these well-established sort of surrogate markers as, as more endpoints. So, so do you think that maybe the, that even though we, yes, we do need an FDA, that maybe we have a pretty inefficient FDA at this point? Um, I think there are aspects of inefficiency um, and, you know, and aspects of, Things like basic things like training. About I think it's 28 percent of the reviewers at FDA have been there for less than two years now. I mean, there's been a huge influx of people. Uh, some of the historical memory that we're talking about, that you're talking about it, it is not there. Um, but I tell you what drives a lot of it, and that's resources, uh, and specifically resources that uh, for activities that are not user fee funded. I mean, one, one of the things that happened with the development of, of PDUFA, the user fee framework where companies pay to have their drugs reviewed, uh, is uh, the, the over, it didn't increase the overall resources of the agency from a scientific perspective. It allowed them to use those resources for the review of those drugs and the post, some, now for the post-market safety, the surveillance of the post-market safety of those drugs. But it, in terms of the critical path program, which was that promise that you're talking about, in terms of programs to help speed drug development, to speed development of biomarkers, to develop new regulatory tools, whatever it might be, uh, that has barely been funded. 
And one of the things I think we need to look at and Congress needs to look at is are we overemphasizing, uh, we don't necessarily want to take away from the review process because PDUFA has been a success as well in terms of shortening the certain bumps along the way, shortening the review times. Uh, but where the money hasn't gone is regulatory science. How does FDA approve things more quickly? How does it get to a confidence level to be able to make the type of tough decisions it needs to make? So I, I think it's a comp uh, there's a complex answer to that. My experience, FDA is not arbitrary in terms of demanding things. It happens, but on the whole, I think the agency has enormous amount of integrity, comes and goes in terms of the way it handles things. But it's a lot of it is about resources. If you look at the list of new authorities that have been provided to FDA over the last 25 years, uh, it, it is a list that goes on for pages and pages and pages. And the resources, until last year when there was a, a, a significant increase, but still you know, minimal, uh, those, those resources have essentially re remained static. And that's, you know, that's a problem. So I just had a question about uh, t FDA tests, the different uh, regulatory pathways for tests and the effect that has on clinical practice. Uh, it seems that I think there was a study in uh, 2009 that was published at, on HER2 testing that suggested something like 66% of patients who got her, uh, uh, um, Herceptin had no documented record of getting uh, a HER2 test. Um, and then the, obviously KRAS, I think uh, David Snow from Medco yesterday had a statistic that was maybe 3%, I'm not sure if it was 3% actually had heard of KRAS among practicing oncologists or 3% were testing of the people who were prescribing Herbitex. But uh, can you just comment on to what extent you see FDA approval as a means to gaining greater, greater efficacy in clinical practice? Well, I, I mean, I'm not a clinician, obviously. But um, you know, I, I think uh, that's an area that, uh, again, there's not a lot of money put into education on personalized medicine and training on, on some of these technologies that are necessarily coming out. I mean, companies are out there. And obviously, they detail the physicians and, and tell them about it. Uh, but, you know, there's a fine line between the dissemination of that information and mandating programs where companies actually, actually have to ensure that a test is, is, is given uh, in conjunction with, with a product. The most potent uh, tool for ensuring that occurs is payment. The doctor's not going to get paid for doing the right thing and using the technology, technology that, that's out there to ensure that a patient uh, is getting the right product. Once once the payor is satisfied that, in fact, that makes sense from a payment perspective, that relationship has been validated, as in the case of warfarin and the judgment that was made there, um, then uh, that's the biggest tool that I see out there from a physician perspective, is if they're not going to get paid, uh, they're going to think twice and they're going to be much more careful about how they uh, approach this. Sure. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.